The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello, it's The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, should the Science Museum in London stop taking money from the oil company Shell? We talk to a student activist about the latest protests and the museum's response. As well as talking to Anya Nanning Ramamurthy of the UK Student Climate Network and Chris Garrard from Culture Unstained about oil sponsorship, we also hear from Michael Landy about his exhibition Welcome to Essex. And in this week's Work of the Week, we hear the choice of the artist Shazia Sikander, who has a new exhibition at the Morgan Library and Museum in New York. Before that, you may know that we've launched a book club at the Art Newspaper with news, excerpts, interviews, live events and more. You can sign up to the monthly book club newsletter and indeed all our newsletters at theartnewspaper.com. Click on the newsletter link at the top right of the homepage. Now, the Science Museum in London's increasingly controversial relationship with the oil company Shell made the news again last weekend when a group of youth climate activists staging a protest against Shell at the museum were threatened with arrest by the Metropolitan Police. Members of the London branch of the UK Student Climate Network planned a sleepover with live stream discussions at the museum as part of a protest against the climate exhibition Our Future Planet, which is sponsored by Shell. The police response was significantly different to the policing of similar protests at Tate Modern and the British Museum in recent years, which were allowed to continue. We invited the Science Museum onto the podcast to give their view, but they declined. So I spoke to Anya Nanning Ramamurthy of the UK Student Climate Network, one of the protesters who was ejected from the museum, and Chris Garrard, co-director of the ethical sponsorship campaign group Culture Unstained, about fossil fuel sponsors, the latest activism, and whether the Science Museum is increasingly an outlier in its defence of oil company support for museums. Chris, before we talk about the specific actions last weekend, can you set the context of the oil sponsorship at the Science Museum and recent events? Sure. So there's a long history of oil sponsorship at the Science Museum. Uh, So the Energy Gallery, which uh, a lot of people go to that's on the first floor, um, was actually designed in close collaboration with a team from BP. And so when the Science Museum director is constantly saying there's no kind of editorial influence or anything like that, it's actually not an accurate picture at all. And at this point in time, Shell is the real focus of the campaigning because it's the sponsor of this new exhibition, Our Future Planet, on uh, climate solutions, on things like carbon capture and storage, which fossil fuel companies often overstate in order to keep drilling for more oil and gas. But they're not the only one. So uh, a little while back, the Science Museum opened Wonder Lab, uh, which is actually called Wonder Lab, the Equinor Gallery. And Equinor is the Norwegian state oil and gas company. And they have recently said we're going to continue increasing our oil output over the coming decade. Um, They basically have no intention of getting us to where we need to be in terms of climate change. And then BP also remains a partner of the Science Museum. It's actually helping train science educators in STEM education as well. So the fossil fuel industry is deeply embedded in the museum and the director is very happy to defend and maintain those relationships. Can you tell us something about the way that he's been defending? Because I think this is significantly different to a lot of the way that other museums are talking about oil sponsorship. Um, We have access to these emails, which are leaked, I presume. And in these emails... Ian Blatchford, the director of the Science Museum Group, goes to quite long lengths to to defend the sponsorship and explain why they are being sponsored by these oil companies. Can you say something about what he's saying and and, and his means of defending the the oil sponsorships? So the defence he makes of these partnerships and sponsorship deals is deeply, deeply concerning in terms of how our kind of national museums are meant to be run. So it's in the Science Museum's ethics policy that he should be acting with honesty, integrity, and not not making misleading comments. Now, the emails you refer to, he writes to the whole staff body and says, you know, we're working with these companies because they've got commitments to reach net zero by 2050, which is in line with the Paris Agreement, and to sort of state this as fact disregarding that many climate scientists, many campaigners dispute that, but actually 
A Dutch court recently ruled that Shell was not aligned with the Paris Climate Agreement. The Transition Pathway Initiative, a sort of investor research group, have also said no oil and gas company is on track to meet the targets of the Paris Climate Agreement as well. So what he's doing is actually very kind of problematic and very dangerous by making these misleading assertions. And what he's also done in those emails is is make criticisms of people such as George Monbiot and others that have pulled out of the series of climate talks the museum was hosting and sort of been quite disparaging about them. And someone like George Monbiot has a a huge amount of experience and expertise, primarily around climate solutions and defending the environment. So it's it's not a great look. And, And just that point that you make about the Science Museum being different, standing apart from other museums, is he was interviewed by the Financial Times at one point and said, even if the museum were lavishly funded by public money, I would still want to take money from the oil companies. So for him, this is not about funding. It's not about the financial standing of the museum. It's about his desire to to maintain these close relationships that often he personally holds with people senior in these companies. Two of the contentions of the Science Museum are that, on the one hand they have to work with oil companies because they, according to them, have the logistics, the people, etc., to make the difference, to to be able to turn the juggernaut of, of climate change around. And then on the other hand, there's this idea that by working with the oil companies, the Science Museum can hold them to account. What do you make of that? I mean, they're great sounding lines, but they're utterly hollow. Firstly, that point about having the resources and the people and the expertise. Yes, there's a lot of people with expertise in these companies. There's, there's no dispute in that. But if if anyone does a simple Google search, for example, of where BP is putting its money, what Shell is lobbying for, uh, what Equinor is primarily involving itself in, it's not the wind farms it's doing around the UK, it's the oil and gas it's trying to get out of the Arctic. We don't have to look far to to really see the truth of what these companies are still involved in and what they're prioritising, and that's that's maintaining the status quo in order to protect their profits. It's very transparent as well, and there's a responsibility for museums to do this. So in the Museums Association's Code of Ethics, it says they must exercise due diligence to understand the values of, of corporate partners. So if, if the museum goes away and does its homework properly, it's really plain that None of these companies are on track to to actually get us to 1.5, let alone 2 degrees, which is what we we need to try and get to. Anya, you were part of the UK Student Climate Network. Can you set the context about about that organisation and what kind of activities you you do? So I'm part of the UK Student Climate Network uh, London group, and we've been kind of behind, I guess, what we're most well known for is the climate strikes in 2019, where thousands of kids um, across the country and around the world walked out of school on Fridays to um, protest the inaction around climate change and yeah so we were we were behind kind of hosting and organizing the the strikes in London and since then we've kind of moved off of doing strikes um, and into wider campaigns so one of those campaigns is around the the science museum and the the shell sponsorship and fossil fuel sponsorship of the science museum. Okay, so can you tell us what you did at, at, at last weekend when you when you went to the Science Museum on, on Saturday? Yeah, so last weekend we went down to the Science Museum with some scientists from Scientists for XR and BP or Not BP to protest this, this Shell sponsorship. We uh, set up an alternative exhibition outside of the, the current Our Future Planet exhibition with a live stream that was planning to be run for 24 hours with people from around the world, from scientists, climate activists, um, lots of different organisations, uh, speaking about climate change, about uh, fossil fuel sponsorship in the arts industry, uh, lots of wide range of things. Um, and we were also engaging with the public outside of the exhibition, kind of talking about climate change, talking about Shell's um, involvement and, yeah, just generally educating uh, we we plan to to stay overnight and occupy the science museum, but unfortunately, we at around eight o'clock got threatened with arrest, and so we took the group decision that we we would leave the science museum at that point, and did stop the live stream uh, just because it, we needed time to process what had happened. 
On Sunday, we went back to the Science Museum. Uh, we had been planning overnight to kind of create new placards. In the current exhibition, there's placards being displayed from the March 2019 strike. The individuals who donated to the Science Museum had no knowledge that they were going to be in the exhibition and it was going to be in an exhibition sponsored by Shell. Um, and we actually did speak to one of the donators who was absolutely appalled and yeah she was on our live stream and so we were planning to kind of make some alternative placards to offer to the science museum that would draw attention to Shell's horrors uh, but that obviously didn't happen so when we came back on Sunday we did a protest outside the science museum and uh, continued to to make placards uh, to leave at the science museum which we did. The response to the protest was significantly different to those that have been held at both the British Museum and the Tate, right? Yeah. Can you say something about that? Because basically, is it right that, that it's up to the museum as opposed to the police themselves what action is taken? Yeah. Um, so both the British Museum and the Tate have experienced like people occupying the museum overnight. And both of those have uh, been facilitated safely and calmly without police involvement, without police kind of coming and trying to intimidate protesters. Because it's on private land, the kind of owners of the museum or those acting on behalf, so in this case the security, have to uh, call the police. Yeah, so we got threatened for aggravated trespass, which actually they had no grounds to um, arrest us on, but we were pretty sure they would arrest us and we just wouldn't be charged later because it's private property, so it's actually a civil matter, not a criminal matter. Chris, what do you think this says? I mean, because it is the, the museum's decision, would that be a decision made individually by the security team, or would effectively the, the people that run the museum have to be involved in that decision, do you think? So there are a kind of different levels within the museum, and I, I think what it's potentially revealing of is that maybe a bit of division within the museum that there are curators and staff who are very engaged on these issues who want to uh, sort of promote debate and discussion about climate change and then a bit of a disconnect with the board and the senior management and what seems to have happened at the weekend is this real change between actually a really good relationship with staff and security a desire to facilitate young people and scientists so the key stakeholders of the museum raising these concerns and then this what seemed like a really sudden about turn where all of a sudden 30 to 40 police officers are marching in to confront young people and threaten them with arrest and and there actually needs to be a, I think, a response from the Science Museum about who made that decision and why did they make that decision. And, and it's really, again, going back to those values in the museum's ethics policy and, and what they claim to be for young people and scientists, you know, like, well, it's completely at odds with that. And there needs to be some response to that. And you know, that's key in terms of your group, isn't it? Because it's your future that you are talking about here. And it's also, I mean, I know that the um, Student Client Network has campaigned for responsibility throughout the educational system, right? You're asking for people of your age and younger to be told about climate in a realistic and honest way. And that's not happening, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the kind of national demands was Teach the Future. And there's a separate campaign um, running around that to try and get climate change and ecological crisis within the um, education system, like throughout the curriculum. It's definitely something that's kind of core to our beliefs that we need to be getting honest education um, around the climate crisis. And the Science Museum, you'd think, would be very much supportive of that, given that like they are an educational institution and there for young people to uh, to understand about science um, so the fact that like this this exhibition is not being completely honest about where we are with the climate crisis um, and actual like solutions that are just I think it, it's made us more angry with what's happening um, especially when they've then gone and used our placards which looks like we've we're kind of supportive of the exhibition and then yeah I guess that when we've tried to engage with them um, as students occupation wasn't the first tactic we used like we've used lots of different tactics including open letters petitions um, protests uh, yeah we've just constantly been ignored um, so I guess the occupation was kind of not our last resort we're not giving up we've still got more to do but uh, yeah it was kind of an escalation from what we'd already been doing and the fact that they're continuously ignoring us and now trying to like I don't know push us back and intimidate us I think it's backfiring on them it's making us want to do this even more. 
Chris, Culture Unstained is constantly involved in educating people about this subject. You're monitoring responses in terms of the public and the wider people in the museum community. Can you say something about what kind of response you have had to the campaigns broadly? Because the, the, the perception in the Director of the Science Museum's emails is that there is a small band of campaigners versus a wider more sensible group of scientists and the and the public can you say something about how accurate is that assertion i mean quite simply it's it's entirely inaccurate and and this is the framing that comes up again and again and it's a device that the director of the science museum and also the fossil fuel companies use in order to try and dismiss legitimate criticism and opposition. And we saw it with the Royal Shakespeare Company that that was people who are the legitimate stakeholders of that institution, actors, performers, theatre makers. And in this case, it's the young people who go to the museum, work with the museum, the scientists. Like, it's bizarre for him to dismiss people like Professor Naomi Oreskes, who wrote the book on how the tobacco industry and fossil fuel industry spread misinformation about climate change and the health impacts of tobacco. But no, she can be dismissed as an activist in his case. And so actually, it's a really broad spectrum of people. It's actually... A quite a, a wide and growing movement and he's finding himself increasingly isolated so the South Bank Centre, the National Theatre, the British Film Institute, the National Gallery have all ended partnerships with Shell, all those partnerships have come to an end and not been renewed and in the Netherlands the Nemo Science Museum in Amsterdam just a, a couple of months ago has ended its partnership with Shell, the Van Gogh Museum, the Concerca about there also. So this is the trend this is where the rest of the sector is at. And the Science Museum is really standing alone here. And, and if anything, the Science Museum, as the Science Museum, should be the one acting on the climate science and, and kind of leading the transition here. And you're someone on the front line of protesting. I wonder, could you say something about how COVID has affected your ability to protest? Because, of course, it's it's an urgent crisis. But in terms of the climate message, it's been potentially damaging because because the world has suddenly focused on COVID. Has has it affected your ability to to protest on the one hand and also to get your messages out there? Um, to an extent, obviously, like. The, the way we were protesting before has had to dramatically change. We couldn't bring thousands of students out onto London streets. And yeah, and with messaging wise, I guess people weren't using like keywords such as like climate crisis, um, the environment, sustainability, that kind of thing. But we strongly believe and see the, the, the links between COVID and between the climate crisis and lots of other kind of social justice issues. And I think that, that although people maybe haven't necessarily been kind of speaking about the climate crisis specifically, it's not been sidelined um, completely. And I think that obviously COVID needed to be spoken about and was on people's minds. And it's quite easy for us to make the links with the climate crisis getting worse and worse. We're going to be seeing more pandemics. I think it's not been that damaging. Um, we've got COP coming up. We had the G7. There is definitely more chance for conversation. But yeah, I don't I don't think it's had too damaging an effect. Uh, Chris, Anya's key word there, I think, is about conversation and, and to what extent there can be a dialogue with the Science Museum at the moment. Do you see any chance that, that this may change in the future? I mean, there's always the possibility of dialogue, but the Science Museum just isn't kind of taking part in that. It's um, They've been hosting this series of climate talks uh, that we referred to earlier. But I mean, there are some really great speakers on it, but it's largely quite performative in a way. It gives this presentation of engaging on climate. We saw the British Museum also host an exhibition on climate change and doing a similar thing as well of like, look, we're engaged on climate change. Just please don't talk about the fact we're being sponsored by BP at the same time. You know, it's, it's doing one thing and looking the other way. But the reason that UKSCN London and uh, scientists have been taking action is because they've approached the museum. They've, they've taken what's meant to be the legitimate routes of writing letters, signing petitions, these kind of things, and they've been ignored. And these museums are meant to be accountable to, to their public, to their visitors, to their stakeholders. And there's just a complete absence of dialogue right now. And, and that needs to change. Obviously, with the COVID crisis, museums are in a terrible position financially now. I would imagine that we are going to encounter 
a very robust response from museums in terms of defence of corporate sponsorship. Is the momentum that it seemed to me had started to build, and as you talked about all those museums that had ended oil sponsorships, for instance, is there any chance that that momentum is now lost and that museums will seek to shut the dialogue down even further as a result of the economic crisis that they're definitely in? One of the things that we saw a few years ago and and we're sort of seeing now is this characterisation that fossil fuel money or or the most unethical sources of funding is is somehow equivalent to all corporate sponsorship. And again, it's one of these devices that could be used to sort of dismiss the question that's in front of us, right? We're being confronted by climate crisis. We know these companies aren't doing what's required and accepting their sponsorship helps to clean up their reputation. And actually, the amount of money that Shell is giving to the Science Museum could be found elsewhere. So that's That's not to um, dismiss or ignore the very real challenges facing the the museums and the cultural organisations right now. But I think that just actually underscores the importance of solidarity between workers and these kind of campaigns as well. These things are interconnected, that when we're talking about how do we sustainably fund museums, we need to talk about making sure there isn't a pressure to take unethical sources of corporate sponsorship, while we might still accept some. But also, how do we ensure that workers are paid and supported and and are not constantly facing the threat of redundancy? And I think that's the way we approach this question. It's it's not a kind of either or. That's really interesting. I have to ask you, just while we've been talking, news has emerged that George Osborne is the new chair of trustees at the British Museum. What's your response to that, Chris? I think as an initial response, I would say it's tone deaf and a waste of an opportunity. And the reason I would say that is twofold. So one, the challenges that are facing the British Museum right now are those those questions about colonial legacies, about restitution, and about BP sponsorship. And so the opportunity for the British Museum was to find a person with the expertise, with the insight, with the leadership, to be able to respond to those issues. Um, to to kind of speak to those issues, to engage with the the various communities and and stakeholder groups in a way that someone like George Osborne really isn't placed to do. And a a concerning thing, particularly on the issue of climate change, is George Osborne was responsible for a policy which was about maximising the amount of oil and gas we get out of the North Sea oil fields. So, again, is he really going to be able to grapple with the issues around an issue like BP sponsorship? I really don't think he is. And and yet again, we're looking at a major national museum being led by a white, middle-aged man. And that is the case at the Science Museum, the Natural History Museum, the Victoria and Albert Museum. It, it goes on and on. And if we want to try and shift representation in the sector, if we want a more diverse and inclusive sector, we can't keep appointing white, middle-aged men to these positions of power within our cultural institutions. We just... We just can't. Chris and Anya, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. As I said, the Science Museum declined our invitation to talk to us, but instead sent a statement from a spokesperson. It reads as follows. Our on-site team calmly facilitated some protest activities within the museum for around five hours on Saturday afternoon. When the museum closed, a group of protesters was asked to leave in line with our duty of care for the health and safety of everyone in the building. The group peacefully left the museum just before 9pm. You can read more about this story at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iPhone and iPad, which you can get from the App Store. Coming up, we head to Essex to talk to Michael Landy and to New York to hear from Shazia Sikander. But first, here are a few of the top stories on our website this week. The Royal Academy of Arts in London, or RA, has apologised to the artist Jess Duvalls for removing her works from its gift shop after she was accused of expressing transphobic views in a 2019 blog. As Gareth Harris writes, the RA said it should have handled the situation better. Last week, the Academy issued a statement on an Instagram story saying that it had received complaints for selling works by an artist expressing transphobic views, though it didn't mention Duvalls. Duvalls said that her work was pulled from the gift shop after a concerted effort from online activists over her alleged 
transphobia. Following a media furor, the RA said, we have apologised to Jester Viles for the way we have treated her and do so again publicly now. We had no right to judge her views on our social media. This portrayed our most important core value, the protection of free speech. The Belgian government has approved a plan to restitute artefacts in national collections that were looted during the colonial era to the Democratic Republic of Congo, or DRC, following similar initiatives in Germany, France and the Netherlands. As Catherine Hickley writes, the Kern, or inner cabinet of the Belgian government, last week approved a proposal by Thomas Dermin, a state secretary in charge of scientific policy in the Belgian government, calling for an official bilateral accord with the DRC, quote, to take a coordinated and shared approach to the question of objects acquired in an illegitimate manner during the the colonial era. Dermine said the question is not whether they should stay in Belgium, they don't belong to us. The OCAT gallery in Shanghai closed indefinitely last week after a public outcry over the video piece Uglier and Uglier by Song Ta. The work features over eight hours of surreptitious footage that the artist's team shot of 5,000 college women, ranking them, in his opinion, in order of their attractiveness. As Lisa Movius writes, the group exhibition, titled The Circular Impact, opened in April and was due to run until the 11th of July. The controversial video, called Jiao Hua, or Campus Flowers in Chinese, has been shown several times before, including at the UCCA Beijing in 2013, when it also generated controversy. You can read all these stories and more at theartnewspaper.com or on the app. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. This summer, Christie's presents 20th, 21st Century, London to Paris, an auction series juxtaposing the artistic masters of the 20th century with the most exciting contemporary names of today. With three sales live-streamed on the 30th of June, the headline evening auctions kick off in London with the 20th 21st Century London Evening Sale, featuring works from Edgar Duggar, Bridget Riley, Alberto Giacometti, Alexander Calder, Pablo Picasso, Jean-Michel Basquiat and Banksy. Following immediately after, Collection Francis Gross and 20th 21st Century Paris Fond du Soir in Paris bring together important names such as René Magritte, Pierre Soulages, Jean Dubuffet and Zhao Wuqi. The corresponding day and online sales offer a wide range of paintings, sculpture and works on paper from the period. Two great cities, six unmissable auctions. Discover the season's top works and more information on christies.com. Welcome back. Just a reminder that you can hear the latest episodes of our sister podcast, A Brush With, featuring in-depth conversations with some of the world's leading artists wherever you're listening to this. The latest episode features the British artist Julian Opie. Now, another British artist that gained huge attention, like Opie, in the 1990s is Michael Landy. His latest exhibition, Michael Landy's Welcome to Essex, opens this week at the First Sight Gallery in Colchester, in the southeastern English county of Essex. Like Landy, the art newspaper's contemporary art correspondent, Louisa Buck, grew up in Essex, and she went to Colchester to talk to him. The southeast England county of Essex, that lies to the northeast of London, has a reputation for being a rather vulgar, flashy place, populated by loads of money Essex men in shiny suits clutching cans of lager, and Essex girls are the butt of many sexist jokes, typically sporting orange fake tan, hair extensions, white stilettos, and prone to some raucous drinking habits. Well, I'm an Essex girl. Um, I'm not wearing my stilettos or my extensions right now. But I'm in the heart of Essex, in Colchester, in my hometown, and I'm here in First Sight Gallery, where Michael Landy, my fellow Essex native, has put on a wonderful show devoted to all things Essex and also a chunk of his, his work practice where he, whereby he pulverises entire possessions. The show is called Michael Landy's Welcome to Essex, and we're welcomed in the foyer by this several stories high, huge model of an Essex man clutching his can of lager. Michael, Essex man, what propelled you to make this Essex man and indeed the show all about your home county? My drawing is based on an illustration by Colette and the illustration was in um, an article that Simon Heffer wrote back in 1990 called Maggie Smaller where he literally coins the phrase Essex man. He's wearing a slightly uh, cheap, ill-fitting grey suit. He's holding a can of lager. He's rather Neanderthal in his, uh, in his look and he's, he hates culture that's why I've got him really staring out so when people come in through the door Essex man is giving them a dirty look so that's what I like about it that he, he's, he's got a Rottweiler and he doesn't like foreigners 
So the sign here says, welcome to England's most misunderstood county. You've got the threatening anti-cultural guy looking at us here. I mean, is, is part of this show a quest for you to reinstate your home county? Um, it's partly, yeah, because Ilford left being Essex in 1965. Ilford being your hometown? That's what, yeah, I was brought up in Ilford. So for my interest in, in Essex, it's actually like the 80s, 90s. It's kind of being brought up, kind of Essex boys that I used to know as well. And the kind of, you know, the world changing in a sense. Since I left school in 79 when Margaret Thatcher came to power. And the, and the country really does change. And then obviously the advent of the Big Bang and, and the markets opening up to young Essex men who wanted to make a lot of money who were working class, you know, going into London to make money. And, and at that point, like the old Etonians and, you know, the whole old boy network kind of got broken down. So, yeah, I try and unravel that. You know, obviously my interest as an artist is all about materialism and... And I think as, as a country, I think we really changed. And obviously, working class people really embraced uh, Thatcherism. I've got some TV footage of when the Tory party get rid of Thatcher and they go to Romford in Essex and they go to Hollywood's, this place called Hollywood's Nightclub. And Essex man is really angry because they didn't really particularly like the Tory party, but they loved Maggie. And they were so angry when she got stabbed in the back and they kicked her out of power. And so um, Essex man already existed in the 80s, but he coined the phrase and people always referred to it. And here he is, this Colossus, this Essex Colossus, welcoming us in, or perhaps facing us down, actually. Yeah, it's 8.5 metres high. And like I say, um, Simon says he doesn't like culture. He comes from, like, South Essex, really. He's, he's, you know, he's, his parents are from the East End, who, who then came out into Essex to make better lives for themselves. Very similar to, like, the Plotlanders, who came from smoky old London between the walls to buy a bit of uh, English soil for five pounds to make better lives for themselves as well. So, you know, they're aspirational, but they're also uh, very kind of working class characteristics as well, want, want, you know, to get out of London, make a better life. For, and Essex Man is very much a family oriented person. This year also marks the 20th anniversary of Breakdown, when you famously pulverised all your possessions. How many was it? Uh, 7,227 in a kind of factory setting in the old CNA shop on, on Oxford Circus. And in a way, your work, as you said, is so much about consumerism, about capitalism, about consumption. And part of this exhibition is devoted to breakdowns. Let's go and have a look at that, because it really ties in with what you were saying about Essex being this kind of cusp county of Thatcherism, of the beginning of the opening up of the City of London. And, you know, I think the first supermarket was in Essex as well. Oh, was so it? OK, got, yeah. So my, I mean, centre. my the belongings, once they got broken down, into their material parts actually ended up in Muckin, which is in Essex. It was a former landfill site and now it's like a Essex wildlife zone. So we're now in the section of the show that's devoted to breakdown where in February 2001 you pulverised all your worldly possessions. I mean, that was a, a hell of a thing to do. What, what triggered that desire to do that? Um, I guess, materially speaking, I was ahead for the first time in my life and I, everything up until that point was a real struggle. So then I thought about what did that mean, and then it just popped into my head that I would destroy all my worldly belongings. And, and we're talking everything. We're talking a tea bag, yeah. we're talking a button, we're talking your car, we're talking yeah. artworks, Underwear, everything. books, artworks. Yeah, literally, yeah, I made a whole inventory of everything I owned, and that's what's, what we're looking at on the wall at the moment. Which, which is listed meticulously. It's, it's numbered, I mean, everything. You won a Chris Ophelia screen print that went... I mean, just everything, yeah, absolutely things with some everything. kind of material value, other things with more sentimental value, things that just were in my possession at the age of 37 when I did break down. And so, uh, you know, I talk about it being the ultimate consumer choice. As a consumer, we all have choices. And that was my choice. So it wasn't really so much of a cathartic gesture as an examination of what makes us who we are and yeah, why about we being human and, and obviously owning things, possessing things are very much a human characteristic. And I think the most interesting thing for me was what people brought to it as far as their own feelings of ownership and consumption. You know, they saw my things from various states being broken down and, pe and really people responded in, in a very kind of direct way because obviously uh, Essex man, you know, he, he works his whole life to accumulate things and there I am destroying it all. 
And also, I mean, there you are destroying it all, but you didn't just destroy any old how. It was a whole kind of performative artwork where, you know, it was this amazing factory-like setting. You designed the conveyor belts, you designed people's uniforms. Every single aspect had your aesthetic eye on it. Oh, yeah, it was completely it. designed. I had material rec- it was based on a material reclamation facility, which basically takes things of uh, value out of the waste stream. It's like 100 metres of conveyor belt. It took like one object about 10 minutes to travel around this kind of scale electric set. And then, yeah, and people would see things in various states of, um, you know, you could see my car, but then it would get broken down to bits and pieces. And then you see, you know, uh, coats, clothes, literally everything that was in my possession at the age of 37, I itemized. And we can hear in the background the film of the bits of landy life <laughs> being I think that's Dave Nutt, down. my um, Saab Buddhist mechanic who destroyed my car. He's breaking down my car in parts <laughs> he afterwards he, he keeps a bit of the powder material and, and he and it sprinkles it under a, a sacred tree in india well it's better than the landfill in essex i guess but we're going to go to more bits of essex now back into more of the exhibition devoted to all things essex but also relating very much still to this notion of labor consumerism things that people overlook, things that people kind of disregard. I mean, when you finished pulverising all your possessions, you then did these beautiful series of etchings of common or garden weeds. Yeah, because um, the reason I became an artist in a way was because I had the facility to draw. And so um, I just wanted to um, simplify my whole practice and just go back to something I really understood. So it's just me and a plant, and then you try and render that plant, you know, a living plant that's dying on you as quickly as possible to capture it, really. And here we are now in Essex, the county that's so derided. I've got, there's a sign here saying, welcome to Essex. I love the warning. This archive contains flash cars, big watches and false boobs. I'm also liking the definition of Essex girl on the left here. The Oxford Dictionary of Essex girl. Essex girl noun, after Essex man, British derogatory, a contemptuous term applied usually jocular to a type of young woman supposedly to be found in and around Essex and variously characterised as unintelligent, promiscuous, and materialistic. Well, I might possibly qualify for some of those characteristics. I'm not going to say which ones, but um, it is funny, isn't it? These kind of really raging stereotypes. And we walk into the show, and there we have a whole series of banner headlines hanging on hoardings from the ceiling, a kind of maze of banners, like flags. And the first one we see is Essex Man has seen off socialism. Yep, they're all taken from newspapers over the last 30 years about how the media have uh, portrayed Essex. We've got one saying, you can't be in Harry Potter, you're from Essex. There are no virgins in Essex, and that's official. <laughs> <laughs> Sexy Saxons, the Essex girls of old England. I mean, it's, it's quite mind-boggling, actually, that these, these headlines were allowed to be written in the mainstream press because I think that's what I'm looking at there, looking at the... Yeah, exactly. I don't, you would not be able to write these kind of headlines anymore. So, I mean, but that's the part of the, that kind of interests me. James Wentworth, with Dave, we've just walked past, says uh, Essex, the uh, dustbin of London. And so, because uh, you literally have the estuary, so, like, good things come from the estuary, new ideas and all sorts of things. You know, um, that's one of the first things I noticed, are lots of forts along the estuary trying to keep foreigners out from invading. The map I have when you first come into first sight is the first map of Essex, and they basically draw that because they want to keep the French out, so they have to plot everything out so they know what they're defending. So for me, it's like, you know, as a sign, it's a much maligned county in a way. And so I was really, because I'm interested in waste, obviously, and and the value we give to things that we throw away. So um, so I think Essex has been this kind of, you know, stopping point for the media, partly because it's so close to London in a way. So you have lots of lazy journalists turning up here and fox popping people from Rumford or whatever. And, you know, um, Basildon Man was a barometer for elections back in the early 90s. So they are my interests, really. So, I mean, they are negative headlines about Essex, but I don't necessarily see that as a negative as such. I'm obviously trying to project stuff back at people in a way. It's also taking a kind of social barometer and taking a kind, as you say, foregrounding things that are disparaged and asking why and asking how we define ourselves through these stereotypes or how people define us through these stereotypes. Yeah, it's a simplified version of something, isn't it? A stereotype. It's like it's just a simplified... I mean, even the Republican Party in America get in on kicking Essex as well because that's a picture of Jaywick. A big billboard-sized picture, yeah. And, you know, it's basically saying 
saying that if you vote for the uh, Democrat Party, then you're going to end up socialism. This is what you're going to end and up they like. They use a picture of Jay Wick, Wick yeah. for President Trump's campaign in America. Yeah, I know. I mean, America's bizarre. got quite a few crummy places it could have photographed. Strange. I, I know, but yeah, exactly. And then right next door, you've got Towie, The Only Way is Essex, a famous reality show with them all looking very kind of burnished and buffed and Well, they're, 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 like, the, they're like the grandchildren of Essex Man in a way because Essex Man, you know, he's very savvy, he goes into London, to, he's got the instinct to make money. So he's got a very good instinct to make money and he's ruthless, as these are like the grandchildren. So they, they are their own products in a way. They sell themselves. So, so the joke was on Essex at the beginning, but then su suddenly Essex gets in on the joke as well. And even at the beginning, at the other end of this room, um, through, the, through the wonderful wheelie bins stuffed full of trash with the monitors in which they've turned off, but which will be playing all manner of Essex stuff, Gavin and Stacey, the only way is Essex, all these kind of interviews with people making Essex comments and remarks. At the other end, you've got Harry Enfield playing his wonderful role of loads of money, clutching a great wad of banknotes. Yeah, we've got TV footage of, uh, of uh, Harry Enfield driving into Essex with his wad and he's waving his wad saying, like, get this developed up. Yeah, so he wants to develop the whole of, like, rural Essex. So, and, like, you're urinating on trees. But that was kind of, uh, you know, it's a pastiche in a way, but also there was a truism about it as well. When the country did change from, you know, the 80s, mid-80s onwards, Someone said that greed was good once again in this country. People could buy their own homes, well, which was a very right the, to buy, which was a very popular policy. That's one of the, one of the galleries actually has a, a wonderful leopard skin lined vitrines with all manner of Essex girl jokes and stuff in it. Yeah. But the sign at the door marks that very fact. That yeah, it was. Harold Hill, is the I think it's the first... Uh, you know, the Tory party tapped into working class people wanting to own their own homes, wanting to own shares in uh, British utilities. So your first you own your own home was actually in Essex? It was in, yeah, in Harold Hill in Essex, owned by the Patterson family. And we got like TV footage of uh, Thatcher coming to visit them and have a cup of tea with them. And there's lots of people outside, you know, saying Maggie, 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 out, 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 which was a very popular phrase at the time. I remember shouting it. And then we come into this particular room, which shows that the, the, the history of Essex actually predates Maggie Maggie out, 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 and Essex Man, and indeed even the map that's at the entrance charting the way, because here, set into the floor, we have a very, very ancient relic. Tell me what we're looking at here. This is based on the Dagnum Idol, and the Dagnum Idol was uh, unearthed in um, 1922 when they were clearing the groundworks for the Ford Motor Works. And they found this old uh, idol buried in the marshland that, that dated back to 2250 BC. And it's, I think it's a fertility figure. It's like the oldest figure human representation um, we have in this country. With the wonderful detachable penis. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's an artistic liberty I took. <laughs> there are very similar figures like this in Hull where they literally had a detachable phallus. Some people speculate it's only got one eye, and Odin only had one eye, and uh, the Scots pine was uh, carbon dated to Northern Europe, so it's probably Danes or something, and Odin was a shapeshifter, so it could become male or female. I'm loving it, gender fluid in Essex. Exactly. And also, very shiny, I think you've blinged yeah, it up I've, a bit. I decided that Scots pine wasn't really the thing, so I thought I'd make, this is called a... Uh, Essex Idol, so I've kind of opened it up really, so it's no longer just Dagnum Idol, it's, it's Essex Idol, but it's the same size and um, yeah, it's a fertility figure. Well, a very fertile show, full of fertile ideas. I mean, people are going to come here. Obviously, all of us Essex natives and indeed locals will love it because it has so much information about the county. But it also seems like you do want to bust some stereotypes as well. Um, well, I kind of deal with the stereotypes in a way because there's no point trying to... I mean, because like, obviously I'm interested in things being buried. So I try, obviously I talk about it like you're unearthing things, like things get buried underground, like the Dagnum Idol, like my worldly belongings. And, but then at some point, someone comes on and digs them up. And I think, obviously, Essex, in a way, doesn't really want to deal with this stuff, really, because it's like they've had enough of it. You know, they've been sick of the way they've been portrayed. But uh, obviously, that's, that's what I'm interested in. So Essex is now firmly back on the map. Everybody listening, come down to First Sight and celebrate all things Essex. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Michael Landy's Welcome to Essex is at first sight in Colchester from the 26th of June to the 5th of September. 
And finally, it's time for the work of the week. The Pakistani-American artist Shazia Sikander's exhibition Extraordinary Realities has just opened at the Morgan Library and Museum in New York. It features work from the last 15 years in which she's created a distinctive contemporary take on the rich traditions of manuscript painting in South and Central Asia. Sikander spoke to Helen Stoilis, our editor in the Americas, about Krishna and Radha beneath a flowering tree, a manuscript miniature in the Indian Nathadvara style, painted between 1825 and 1850, which is in the Morgan's collection. You can find an image of the work on our website, click on the podcast tab and look for this episode. So Shazia, you've selected a work that's part of your show at the Morgan Library. It's a standalone page showing Radha Krishna beneath a flowering tree. Can you tell us a bit about why you chose this work? How does it kind of speak to you? I was perusing the collections. I've came across this painting and it had a amazing, uncanny connection, direct link to a series that I did called The Uprooted Order. And um, I wasn't really looking for works that literally could, would be used as a lens into my exhibition, but just as a uh, a range of things that interest me, possibly for, for thematic reasons. But uh, this particular painting is Radha and Krishna beneath a flowering tree. It's a sort of a Radha Krishna trope. And uh, this one is attributed to Miwar, a kind of a Rajasthani school of painting. What I've done when I've looked at this trope is I have often removed the male elements and just looked at that nature of uprootedness. The Radha Krishna is the the kind of duality of Krishna, right? It's the male and female half of Yeah, of it, you God, know, basically. so many it has been interpreted in in multiple ways over many years and centuries and um and I think as a visual artist I too take so much freedom and but of course there is this um very prominent gendered space within this trope as well and I was interested in dismantling the work and uh, focusing on the feminine and in that process what it meant to explore the idea of uprootedness so it's almost like the male elements exit and the nature of the feminine in its uprooted nature kind of transforms towards an apparatus of power. That has been a kind of a theme in some of the early works of mine, which are on display at the Morgan Library uh, right now. And this particular painting sort of crystallizes that sort of deconstruction. Also, if you look at it really closely, they're not juxtaposed in the show, but you can see that, you know, it's not just sort of just removing the male. It's also like, then analyzing the compositional elements and what additional things I start to add. And that for me is also exciting to see because I painted some of this work more than 20 years ago. And even when I look at the older works, I'm energized every time. There's this timelessness. It feels like it was painted yesterday. It's so fresh, but it's also something that uh, for me, it's very important, this idea of kind of getting deep into this wondrous nature and language and how, you know, how finding ways for it to speak to me in a very continuous manner. Like, what is it that keeps this tradition singing and how to experience that? There's a lot of play with that, too. In the painting, you can see her sort of balancing herself. Uh, onto a tree with, which is blossoming. So in the in my painting, while she is balancing, she is also pinning down with her foot, sort of a shadowy form, which is very kind of ghost-like, uh, like a poltergeist. And what is that? So it's almost like, is that her shadow? Is that an alter ego? Is it this idea of assimilation and uh, foreignness or uprootedness but you know towards what so it's so things are in flux but but there's this sort of tension of how she the use of her feet and that kind of element of the older drawing 
how I've taken that and kind of played with this notion of rootedness or disrupting that. So uh, that's the uprooted series that this particular historical work really directly uh, plays with. And your work in general kind of plays with this tradition, as you said, of miniature painting from manuscripts, um, which very often kind of focus on heroes, mythologies, these this kind of very male dominated history. But you really put the woman figures, I mean, sometimes inserting them, sometimes by erasing the, the male figures, but um, you really put the women figures as the protagonists, as the heroes, as the heroines. Is that something that you see as kind of a correction or how do you? Well, uh, well, I, I do want to point out to uh, one thing is that, you know, the genre is vast. It's impossible for it to be understood from um, a very narrow perspective. And also my interest in it is to see how the colonial legacy has contributed to the manuscript painting's fate. And that itself has led to a very truncated nature because throughout the colonial history, so much of the paintings have been, you know, taken and placed in Western institutions. The provenance are very complicated that type of dismemberment and dispersion is also not inherent in the tradition. It's, it's an outcome of colonial histories and legacies. So that lens becomes incredibly political and almost violent in nature. And that for me is like how to see the work through that lens to understand the archives. And, you know, and so I, I also want to point out that growing up in Pakistan, this material is not there. It's not available. It's not like it's culturally specific to that experience of growing there. My whole three decade long exploration has been almost like a detective digging into the archives and the archives are literally in majority of the Western institutions in, in Met's collection, British Museum, v you know. I think when you understand that, then you really can disassociated from this projection that here is an artist who is the other, who's from another part of the world, from Pakistan, and this is the language which is, uh, which is prevalent there. You know, that, that kind of, I think you have to like break outside of such very opaque binaries and limitations because of course the genre is vast in its style, in its history, in its language, going all the way into Eastern Europe, Central Asia and China and South Asia, so Persia. So, you know, we're focusing on just one painting, but that cannot be used to illustrate like the larger situation. And this painting, you know, as you said, was taken out of a manuscript. It was disassembled and is on its own now. Yeah, well, of course, it's a page. It's a folio right there. I'm not sure in terms of this particular paintings um, provenance if this was indeed a part of a book but um, there are definitely uh, better examples of pages which have been part of well-known uh, books and manuscripts like the Shahnameh, the Houghton Shahnameh that was dispersed and it's a very well-known example and you know how that entire history of its dispersion and coming into the secondary market getting like a very arbitrary value being assigned to it and how it changes hands because uh, with the de Kooning and when you look at the provenance of many of these paintings it's a very animated history too and that for me as a research driven artist uh, those aspects are equally important when I'm um, examining works I, of course I'm looking at the compositions and the formal nature of the paintings but definitely also wherever possible to dig deeper to find out, you know, where they originate and where they arrive and what they start to accumulate on that route. But coming back to your earlier question, of course, my take in broadly is a very feminist perspective and feminist in a very playful way. So of course, for me to be like, okay, let's, uh, uh, Krishna exits and I focus on Radha and how can I animate that idea further? What happens as she sort of 
becomes this apparatus of power. What what can I do to that trope? What can I do to that image? How can I own it, right? So it's not just an appropriation. It's not just like a copying. It's how do you make something anew? I think that that relationship between what is tradition, what is avant-garde, how tradition is performed, all of these ideas um, excite me. So this nature of women and power, how they intersect and how the the protagonist in this work, where she stands, you know, the idea of that ground, what can I do, the way her feet are, the distance between them, and then kind of adding elements there where suddenly, you know, that reference from the older painting has evolved into something completely different and how I can allow the viewer to come see both the works and add a lot more information. Re, It's open-ended, but it's kind of done in a very precise manner of painting. But uh, my always the intent is to leave some mystery intact. And it's very contemporary. I mean, you know, you look at the figures in your work and they look like women today, you know? Uh, of, of course, you know, and then there are d different ways in which I can play with that is... Uh, of course, so much of this is a very stylized language. So in its stylization, it has already been abstracted. And then, as you see, there are very archetypal um, representations. And for me, it's really exciting. It's like archetypes don't go away. And so how do you tell richer stories, even if you are engaging with archetypes? And that's how I see it. So I see it as a progression. I don't see it like, okay, I, I have to insert my identity into it. Of course, how I'm thinking and my process is going to inform it, but how do I create sort of a non-nostalgic relationship simultaneously? Creating newer iterations or archetypes, many artists' process engages that, often at times in very obvious ways or in indirect ways. So that's how I see it, that how does this trope evolve? What can I do, especially if I'm engaging with a very feminist lens? How can I understand it better? How can I open it up for uh, for kind of a new direction? So just as uh, one other example, she's pinning down, you know, with her one foot, like a very shadowy form, which is how I've created it. It's in white with looping feet and wings. So it's almost like this ghost-like creature that envelops her or she is part of it, is either half inside or half outside. And this idea of being simultaneously buoyant and afloat, at, while at the same time carrying your roots or, or kind of having this rootedness, so this tension, how to create that tension. And, you know, I, I think I was also thinking about the fallacy of assimilation and versus foreignness. So I made this uh, interpretations when I was living in Houston and New York and seeing, you know, all sorts of multiple immigrant narratives were around me and kind of how I could create observations while keeping, you know, my relationship with this language intact. How different that experience can be in different parts of the United States, you know? Absolutely, absolutely. And that is a parallel to um, the language of the Central South Asian manuscript tradition. Like even within the ones that are in South Asia, you can see the incredible heterogeneity of South Asia. You know, there are, there's Jain, Buddhist, Hindu, Islamic, Sikh, Zoroastrian, Christian, Jewish influences. <laughs> Uh, and, and one is not just saying that they are very present and layered. It's a very syncretic kind of culture. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that for me is exciting to be able to shed light on that. And which is very different from uh, kind of the early like that 90s melting pot idea of the US, you know, that right. that, that <laughs> kind of went out the uh, window, it, it, it didn't exist. So like differences are intact. Yeah, differences are being celebrated. But there's uh, things can, you can have autonomy of a variety of languages within a work within a representation and live with a with a variety of differences and yet find common ground there. So that's kind of has always been a push in my 90s work is to 
be curious about the overlapping diasporas and then take those as points of references and fuel them. But the language has been very um, consistently engaged in exploring uh, the, the tradition of manuscript painting because that's the dedication of my entire life's work is how to bring it into the contemporary idiom, how we can do that as artists. So sort of like shrink that uh, silos that are in art history, that something is determined as the other or the tradition and then absolutely as if it exists devoid of any conversation that it had. It, it continues to influence so many Western artists. It has over the years in the past, even at the times that so much of this work was being made, there was already a lot of cross-cultural communication occurring. Well, thank you so much, Shazia. Thank you so much. Shazia Sikander, Extraordinary Realities, is at the Morgan Library and Museum in New York until the 26th of September. It then travels to the RISD Museum in Providence, Rhode Island, where it will be on view from the 12th of November until the 30th of January next year. From there, it travels to the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, where it runs from the 13th of March until the 12th of June 2022. <music> And that's all for this episode. You can subscribe to The Art Newspaper at theartnewspaper.com. Click on the subscribe link at the top left of the page and you'll find a range of subscriptions. And do subscribe to this podcast and a brush with if you haven't already done so. And please give us a rating or review if you've enjoyed it. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Julia Mahalska, Amy Dawson and David Clack. And David also does the editing and sound design. Thanks also to Henrietta Bentel and Daniela Hathaway and to this week's guests, Anya and Chris, Louisa and Michael and Helen and Shazia. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.